I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending some time with us. We have as our guest today, Renee Storms, and I appreciate Renee coming so much and sharing your story. It's a very interesting one. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you were, actually weren't born in Mormonism, is that right? I was not. Yeah, what's your background then? A little. Um, as a kid, uh, my stepdad was military, and so we moved a lot, and my parents... Uh, being military and Navy, there were always a lot of people around who didn't have family. So my parents were hospitable and inviting all their friends in and mm -hmm. all the, the guys from the base. And uh, we mostly had parties every weekend at our house. And oh. I was the bartender. They were, oh, I was going to ask if they were good Christian parties. but No. no these were. <laughs> <laughs> they were drinking parties. Okay. I was the bartender who sat behind the bar and made the drinks for everybody from the time I was about 10. Really? Yes. That's quite an education. It was. <laughs> And uh, what, at 10, you're going to school, I guess, in different schools. That's tough, isn't it, as an Army? I did you know. move a lot. Yeah. Most school, school years were in at least three different places. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time I got to junior high, um, we were able to stay in one place for junior high and high school, which oh. was a nice thing. That was a nice, yeah. Yes. And you uh, are not Christian at all at this, or not Christian, but I mean not religious at all? Not religious at all. Okay. Um, my parents, um, I, I guess they would have said if you were to ask them, they would have claimed Christianity and they would have said they believed in God, but um, there was no evidence of that. There weren't, we didn't go to church. There weren't, um, really there was just nothing that would have, not studying the Bible. I've got the Bible that sat in their house and it, it almost breaks when you open it because it's just stiff. <laughs> and uh, okay. kind of frozen <laughs> in place. Well, you get married rather young. But I you, did. But you marry somebody that you've known since you were six years old. Yes. My uh, ex-husband, his name is Mark, and uh, his dad and my dad, my stepdad, grew up together. Oh. And so, and they were military as well as us. And so from the time we were about six, everybody mm -hmm. said someday the two of us would get married. And so both of us 17, we got married. Wow, and he was actually in the military as well. He was in the Army, yes. Yeah. And uh, what happens after that? Well, after we, moved, we moved to Germany. He, um, one of the reasons we got married so young is that um, his orders changed and he was going to Germany. And if we didn't get married at 17, we wouldn't be able to do that until he got back two years later. Oh. So we, we bumped the date up. His brother was also military. Um, and was stationed in Thailand, his older brother. Mm. And uh, his older brother was a Mormon and had joined the Mormon church at 16. And the so- Missionaries had taught him or what? A girlfriend. Oh, a girlfriend. Uh, yeah, okay. he fell in love with a girl in high school and uh, ended up joining the Mormon church. And um, so when we were in Germany, Mark decided that he wanted to know more about his brother. So he invited the missionaries over to our home when they came by the base. And uh, I wanted no part. I knew a few uh, kids in high school that were Mormon, and I was like, those people are weird. <laughs> they get up early and go to church before school. And uh, the girls yeah. always wore dresses, and there was just things about them that I did not like, and I wanted no part of it. Well, how was your, how was your husband with it? Did he... 
he was kind of a control freak, so he basically laid the law down, more like a dad. He said, you will be out here, you will sit, you will behave, <laughs> you will listen, and you will be nice. And did he accept the message at all? Well, when the missionaries came, I, uh, I was present but hostile okay. in my uh, stance. I gripped the arms of a chair until my knuckles turned white, and I wouldn't speak, I wouldn't shake hands, and I wasn't friendly. And uh, so they ended up saying they couldn't come back. And so they left. And my husband, uh, they left a, a Book of Mormon. And I read it. Did my, they challenge you to read it? Of for, course. Yeah. Read this and, and you'll pray, know the truth. And, and pray about it. You, you will sense the truth in your, in your heart. And uh, so they left that. Now, my husband um, wanted no part of it. He wanted to, he seriously wanted just to know his brother better wanted to know more about his beliefs. What it was that he believed. Yeah. But he was not interested in joining. And, and so I decided to take the challenge, but to prove the missionaries wrong. So I read the Book of Mormon, and um, I went into my room, and they have wooden shades over the windows in Germany. So it gets really dark, and your eyes don't adjust. So it stays dark. <laughs> and uh, But I went in to my room in the dark, and I knelt down to pray. and. I don't remember ever praying any other time in my life. I didn't grow up praying. Up to this point. I don't, I, I didn't do that. There were a couple of times in my early childhood I walked to a church that was just down the street from us. So I may have learned a little bit there, but literally it, you can count it on one hand how many times I've been to church and or if I had ever prayed. prayed. Yeah. So, but I, I decided to prove the missionaries wrong. So I prayed. And I remembered the missionary saying you needed to be sincere. So, you know, I was like, okay, Lord, I, I want to know the truth. I sincerely do. I really want to know the truth. And, and, and you did sincerely want to know the truth. I, you know, I think I did. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I really wanted it to be wrong more than anything. Yeah. But, but I went in with the, I want this to be, I want to know the truth. I want to be sincere in this. And so if this is your church and if the Book of Mormon is true, then I want to know that because I want to follow you. And so as I prayed, um, I sensed the room. Now, my eyes are closed and it's dark, but I sensed the room getting light. Mm. It was as though somebody had come in and turned a light on. I sensed a warmth and a love flow through me. Now, as a child, I was the bartender, and we had a lot of military men spend the night in the house that were passed out. And there were times I would wake up with men in my room, sound asleep and half-dressed, and... So there were things that happened as a kid that were not an ideal childhood, to yeah. say the least. And yeah. so I, I never felt, I guess, truly loved unconditionally. There was always being perfect or doing better or serving your family, your parents. It was my job to take care of them when they drank too much. It was my job to get them to bed, things like that. And so. Mm. At this point, when this love flows through me, it was a feeling I had never experienced, that I just felt totally and completely loved. And I felt like um, if you had just taken a blanket out of the dryer, and it was and nice and warm, it up in you. and they, I just felt wrapped up in it, and arms around it, just this big bear hug, yeah. love. And then I felt the words pass through my mind. I didn't hear anything audible, but I just felt the words, this is my church, and this is where I want you to be. Wow. And so I began to cry. I cried for about two weeks because this was not the response I expected or wanted. And I went back and I went, okay, somehow God didn't understand what I was saying. So let me be more clear. <laughs> Instead of saying, I don't want this church to be true, I don't want Mormonism to be true, I changed, I got rid of all the contractions. I do not not want this to be true. I want to make sure God understood your <laughs> yes. language. Yeah, he couldn't understand me before, I was sure. So I went back and did the same thing all again. Went back through the prayer, telling God, I want to be sincere. I want to know if this is true. I want to follow you if it is, but I don't want this to be true. I don't believe Mormonism is right. Yeah. And all the same things happened again. I felt the light, the love, the blanket, the warmth, the hug, and again, the words. This is my church. So and this there was is where no I question in your mind the church then was At true that point, was I felt like I had no choice but to join the Mormon church and become a Mormon, even though that was not what I wanted. Yeah. It was what God wanted. What did you have to compare to, though? Nothing. Uh, other than, yeah. Okay. Nothing. I had never read the Bible, I'd never cracked open a Bible. My grandmother on my stepdad's side had uh, the couple of times that we saw her, first thing she would do is take me by my hand 
and go sit in her room and read the Bible to me. So mm -hmm. I know that there were times that I read a little bit of heard, the Bible or something. heard the Bible, yeah. but I didn't know the Bible, so I had nothing to compare it to. So did you go grab the missionaries and tell them what, you had, ha what had happened or what Actually, happened? I, I was, that was still in Germany, and then I was, I was pregnant and close to the point where I was going to have to return to the States. So I didn't do anything for a few months, and I came back to came the back States. Came back to the States to have the baby. Yeah. To have the baby, and then when he was six months old, I finally went down to the church, and I remember walking in with my six-month-old baby saying, I already know the church is true. I've already prayed about it. I've had the missionary discussions. I just need to figure out how to join now. And that's at the guy Sunday morning and handing out somebody. bulletins, <laughs> just the guy at the door. I mean, he was shocked. <laughs> he was. Um, but he sat me with his family, and, and so a few weeks later, they, they had me go through the missionary discussions again, wanted to make sure I understood, and I was baptized soon thereafter. What do you remember of what they taught you? What did you come away from then initially? Initially, um, the only thing um, really, well, Joseph Smith was a prophet, Latter-day Revelation, and I felt like they believed in God and Jesus and, and just... I can't say what I had always believed because I don't think yeah. I had that background, right. but I guess what I would have understood or what I would have assumed. Yeah. And then with the experience, twice. Yes. <laughs> you really felt like, okay, I've done the right thing and this is what God wants me to do. Correct. Yeah. No, no questions came up at I all? I had zero questions because I felt that strongly about the experience that I had had. Sure. That it didn't matter what questions I had, this was what God yeah. had said to me and where he wanted me yeah. and so there were no questions so then what happens you your husband comes home do you well he and i actually were separated at the time that i joined the church okay. and then we got back together and he was like i can't believe this was the stupidest thing i ever did was inviting the missionaries over <laughs> and so here you are now a mormon and now i'm a mormon and, okay. and he, i won't drink and he wants me to drink and he, yeah. you know there are different things like that so we had we had some of those issues but he actually um went and got my bishop, brought, his, uh, brought the bishop to the house, and he, the bishop told me, whatever your husband says, you do. And um, you don't argue, you, you submit to your husband. He's the patriarch of the family. And you do what he wants. Even if he's not a yes. member. And so that made it difficult, because I sure. was like, no, Jesus should be the center, yeah. not my husband. And yeah. so there was a battle there. So we, we had our struggles, and sure. I kind of was more, I, I guess, nominal on the margins. I had a visiting teacher and I occasionally went to church. I wasn't super involved until he and I got divorced. Uh, several years later, uh, my youngest, I had three more kids and my youngest was three. And um, she came to me one day um, and because of allegations that she made, we left, me and the kids, and we were taken into protective custody. Mm -hmm. um, and so we left, and um, and that's when I dove into church, 150 percent, and started to do anything they asked. Was everywhere at every and where meeting. Where was this at? That was in California. Okay. Outside, just south of Fresno, in the uh, Hanford mm. and Lemoore. So you area. serve in callings, and yes, uh, you, you eventually go to the temple. I, I moved to Texas in 1987, okay. and when I moved to Texas, I continued to serve, and, and that's where I went to the temple the first time, um, in 1987 to the Dallas Temple. Yeah, what did you think of that? Actually, yeah, I had a friend beforehand who said, go at least six times, put it on your calendar, go six times before you think Make about any it. any judgments about it? <laughs> yes, yeah. and so I kind of did that. That's I, I went a lot, and then right. I was like, okay, and but I remember on Sunday at church, standing in the back going, looking and going, they've been to the temple and they're not crazy and they've been to the temple and they seem okay. Mm -hmm. there, it, it was odd and it, there was something with it, but yet I, I couldn't connect the dots. <laughs> so I accepted it. Sure. Um, and I continued and because I was told it's supposed to be a great experience, I try to be positive and put it a positive spin on things so yeah. that it's it's just a positive experience then yeah. for me. Well, so you're active all this time. Did you have any relationship at all with your first husband's or your husband's uh, brother? No. You, uh, since uh, he when, had become a member? Of when he and I, well, he, he left the church 
oh, okay. somewhere in that time frame that oh. I was super active in the church. Okay. And so uh, he, he was out, and, uh, but there was no connection really between the families. Okay. And when I got divorced, it was me and my kids and, and my mom's side of the family more so than, than anybody else. So you're active and serving, and yes. what happens? I'm active, I'm serving, I'm, I'm doing, I'm dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's and jumping through every And this hoop. is like for 30 years, right? Well, <laughs> from 87 all the way through to about 2000, well, 1999, I guess, is when, or 2002 oh. was when things began. Um, I was a member for 30 overall, okay. but those beginning years, I wasn't yeah. super busy, but I was uh, young women's president, I served in the Relief Society presidency, primary presidency, I, whatever they wanted, I did. Okay. And uh, then um, in 1999, my uh, third child, my oldest daughter, passed away. And when oh. she died, now I had four kids, all of them chose to leave in high school. During seminary times, they all said, this is bunk and I want no part. And all of them had stepped away. Your kids? Didn't all you? my kids. And then I had... Yeah, I did that hurt or I mean oh was I was devastated I was so devastated that all of my kids had chosen to leave and and of course that made me a bad mom somehow yeah, I had failed guilty for to to convey to them the importance of this and to yeah. um, teach them correctly somewhere along the lines and so they all left in high school and then my third child my oldest daughter um, had diabetes and in 1999, she passed away from juvenile diabetes. Oh, gosh. Now, right before, we knew she was terminal. Um, the doctors had prepared us and told us that this was coming. Her stomach had stopped digesting food. Oh, boy. And um, so she decided she was going to go to the temple. And I'm there going, you can't go to the temple because you don't believe anymore. Don't do this. And I'm, I'm telling her, you're bringing condemnation on yourself. Don't do this. For me, Make, I thought she was doing. I thought that... she was going to go and go to the temple to please me. Okay. And so, I'm battling her the whole way, and the bishops on the other side going, "She needs to go and do this. This is a great thing, and this is all good." And so the bishops encouraging her to go, and so she goes to the temple a week before she dies. Mm. And um, so we uh, we lived in Houston at the time. We drove up to Dallas. The Houston Temple hadn't been built; it was in process. And uh, so she went to the Dallas Temple and um, came out, um, it, it took us all day that we had to take a break and let her rest uh, for several hours in the middle. And it was just <clears throat> really, really tough, oh, knowing, of course, what was coming yeah. and me thinking that she was doing this for me to yeah. please me. And as uh, she came through the veil, I had already come through and she said, this time you're waiting on me and next time I'll be waiting on you. <laughs> yeah, and I had several friends with me, and that's been an issue. They, you know, I've had one of them who said, "But you've given up on her by not staying in the church." And so, yeah, so tell us what happens to bring you kind of what makes you start thinking differently okay. about the church. Okay, uh, in that time frame, at first I clung to my beliefs, and then a, a, sure. about two years in, two thousand two, I'm I start thinking, "Where's my eternal family? All my kids have left the church. I don't believe for a minute that Lori." believed when she went through the temple. Yeah, I, I, I totally believed you. that she was doing it for me. Sure. And so none of my kids, I'm not going to be sealed. I, there's no priesthood in my home. My children were never sealed to priesthood. And so where is my eternal family? And, and there's such an importance placed on families. Yes. Families are forever. And... I cried every time they sang that song. Yeah. Every single time. Families can be together forever. I would cry. And so it was just of such huge importance. It's the thing that mattered most. Yeah. And so where is my eternal family? I've worked and served and done all the things I could possibly do, and yet I don't have an eternal family. So now what happens with me? What did you think about Jesus during this period of activity in the church? To be honest, I don't think he came into my thoughts at all. Isn't it kind of a, he's, I, mean, I know he's there, we closed in his name and everything, but sure. he's just not a, he's just not a it's main, not prominent. main prominence, is he? Mm, no. There's no prominence, it's all about the family. Yeah. And the family is. And the prophet and the, the prophet, leaders. And Joseph Smith and, the and whoever the current, the church, the church yeah. but not Jesus. Yeah. Mm -mm. I don't think he ever entered my mind. So you had some conflicts here with the families are forever. Yes. Anything else come up? That, that was it for that moment. And yeah. then I started to question though, because of that, I researched what would happen. And basically 
in the end, after my ex and I both had been deceased, his work would be done and we'd be sealed and my, my children would be sealed. Somebody um, else would do that for you. Right. It would okay. be proxy work later. And I, because of the abuse uh, that my husband had inflicted on me and my children, this, all that I had been taught about God uh, within Mormonism, you don't learn all the attributes of God. For me, all I ever seemed to get was that he is a loving God and he wants just always the yeah. love and the perfect stuff, you know. And so this loving God that I believe in as a Mormon would not want me sealed to this man who had been so abusive to me and my children. Yeah. And so I couldn't get past that. I was like, that's a problem. That's wrong. Something's wrong with this. And so then I went back to the issues I had had along the way um, in 1978 when blacks were given mm -hmm. the priesthood. And I was mm -hmm. like, racist why would this church be racist and I wasn't racist and I was like embarrassed that this even had to be said yeah. that there was even this issue and so then I was like okay what about that let me go look at that and I researched so you started studying a little I started studying yeah, a little and then I dangerous polygamy yeah I was like I had two friends when I was Mormon who said if you're not married before we get there I want you to be my husband's second wife. Oh my goodness. I know. I was like, uh, <laughs> what do I do with that? Yeah. And so I, I looked at the polygamy issue and, and I was like, these are problems and I can't believe yeah. that this is accurate. And so as I'm studying, there's a guy at work, uh, his name is Tim, and uh, he and I worked at the same company and he began to witness to me. He's a Christian. I he guess. is a Christian. Okay. He, uh, he had his Bible out every day at lunch in the break room and he'd be studying and doing a Sunday school lesson and, and working on things. And I always admired how he, he would do this. He yeah. would bring in his Bible and spend his time at lunch studying, studying the Word the of Bible. God. Yeah. And so he starts talking to me. Now, my view, he's asking me questions about Mormonism. What do Mormons believe about this topic or that topic? And I'm thinking, he wants to become a Mormon. He's this good Christian <laughs> guy. And I'm thinking he wants to take that next step up. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm still kind of in that place. And I, even though I'm questioning, I still haven't gotten to a point sure. where I think Mormonism is false, per se. Yeah. There are problems and issues, but not that it's false. And so I think he wants to take the next step up. He wants to move into Mormonism up to the next level. And so um, he's talking to me and sharing. And at some point, he brings up grace. And he asks me what the Mormon view is on grace. Yeah, what would you say? I didn't. I was like, I have a great book for you. And I went home and got a book and brought it back for him. I was like, I can't explain it. I, I can't make it make sense. So I gave him the book. He took it home that night. He read the whole thing cover to cover. And he took little yellow sticky notes and put questions and comments all over my book. And so when he brought it back to me, this little book, the spine's about the width of your pinky finger, is fanned out and it's about like this and just broad wide out and he said would you look at what I've said and I'm like mm, no I don't really care yeah. um, I've got the truth you I've, don't exactly so, yeah. but further down um, he ended up we were um, I was giving him a ride to and from work his car broke down and I was giving him a ride and he brought it up and he said can we can I kind tell you captive audience there <laughs> I was he said can I tell you why your view of grace doesn't align with the Bible or doesn't line up with the Bible. And you'd never heard this before. I, I had not. Yeah. And generally when people wanted to tell me something, they said, you're wrong. And Tim wasn't doing that. Oh, Tim didn't. That was smart. He didn't tell me I was wrong. He didn't tell me I was stupid, which I also heard a lot of, or you're an idiot to believe these things. And when people lead that way, you're not open yeah. to conversation. Yeah. And so Tim's comment of, can I tell you why it doesn't line up with the Bible? was different and well, I was you believed in the Bible at least as far as it was translated, translated correctly. correctly and so I said sure and so he shared with me then differences and I couldn't tell you any of those things right now that he brought up but we talked about that and it kind of stuck with me so shortly after this he ends up moving he gets a different job and I am just now starting to think how can Mormonism possibly be wrong I still have issues with that prayer yeah. that I prayed and what I felt like God had revealed to me. And so even though I had all of these details and facts of what was wrong, I, I couldn't go there because I still had this issue. But God told me. Yeah. God let me know that this church is true. And so we continued on. But he moved on. I got a boss, a new boss that came in 
um, Kelly, and she poured Christ into me daily. She <laughs> was another, astounded. Another she was a great Christian. She is a great Christian. She, um, she poured Christ into me every single day. And I didn't find out until probably four or five years later, she has family that's Mormon. And I oh didn't know that. And wow. so it was, it was an interesting uh, journey. How did you deal then in mentally now with, the, with that message that you got twice? From I, I still, I kind of looked at all the evidence and I went, okay, there's all this evidence that Mormonism is wrong, that these details, it, it can't possibly be true. But I don't know what to do with this snagging feeling back here about that. And so um, I ended up talking to a counselor and who had asked me about my story. And mm -hmm. I had shared with him the same story. And at the end of it, he asked me if the hug that I received with the yeah. blanket and the love, was it physical or was it emotional? And as I thought back, I, it was physical. I could feel on my arms. Mm. It, it was like a hug from behind and, and yeah. like I had a, arms wrapped around me and God a loves grip. You. God and it, loves it, was, you. it was a love. And he said the Holy Spirit would never be physical. That, and as I've read more and studied oh. more, I could say that wasn't the Holy Spirit that answered my prayer. Mm -hmm. That it was, um, you know. A lot the, of people hang on to those little glimpses of. Yes. And, and, and for them, every time it's, well, it proves the church is true, but it really is your relationship with God that, uh, that it is. Is, is the important part. Whether well, it's Galatians, a blessing or a yeah. whatever it is. And Galatians tells us to test the spirits. Yeah. And so one of the things that I learned at the church that I started to attend um, Pantigo Bible Church in Fort Worth, one of the things that I heard over and over and over again, don't believe what I say up here on the stand, go to the Word. Go test it, read and, the Bible. And read it and yeah. see what it says for yourself. And if you feel like the Spirit is telling you something that doesn't line up with the Bible, it's not it's the Spirit, not, it's not the Holy it's Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. And so we have to test the spirits. Okay. Tonight. Renee, we're almost out of time, but I know you're in a ministry right now. I tell am. us Tell us about that and where they can reach you. Okay. Or to hear more. Um, I work for Watchman Fellowship. On the website is Watchman, W-A-T-C-H-M-A-N dot org. And that's with James Walker. James Walker who's is also president. also a former. He is. Guess. He's a former fourth generation Mormon. Okay. And uh, the ministry reaches out, though, to a lot of faiths, not just, it's all alternative faiths, not just Mormonism. Um, so we do outreach also to Jehovah's Witnesses and other mm -hmm. cultic groups, um, Wicca, uh, New Age, anything. That, but just uh, share, share the word and the grace the that word. Jesus yes. has given us. And I'm sure you've appreciated this so much now in your life compared to what we, oh. what you had gone through those 30 years. But yes. Renee, thank you so much. We're out of time, aren't it? We could have listened to you for a lot longer. Uh, anyway, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on the episode of Ex-Mormon Files. <laughs>